The ceiling, le plafond. The floor, le plancher. What is this? Qu'est-ce que c'est? It is the picture. C'est le tableau. The door, la porte. The wall, le mur. How is the table? Wie ist der Tisch? The chair, der Stuhl. The wall, die Wand. The dress, das Kleid. Is the pencil red? Ist der Bleistift rot? Yes, it is red. Ja, er ist rot. And what I proposed was, again, 15 minutes a day, each and every single day, which works out to about 90 hours. And some people wanted to talk about hours of, of learning a language, and that is a good gauge of how far you can expect to get. Um, 90 hours is, and I've been a college professor most of my life, a college semester is 45 hours of instruction. So 90 hours is uh, two semesters of instruction. But I think that by teaching yourself a language, um, you can do it more effectively than in those two semesters of instruction. Uh, if you think about it, the 90 hours that you give yourself by doing it each and every single day is the embodiment of slow and steady wins the race. Whereas uh, if you study two semesters in college, um, you are studying probably uh, two or three days a week. Uh, and then you have breaks, and then you have a long break in the middle, and it's condensed in a couple of um, a couple of months. So uh, it's a different distribution of time. That said, the number of hours that you put into a language, of course, if you are going to speak a language, know a language to a high level, you have to put in many hours of, of quality work. But hours themselves, you can you can waste hours. They're not necessarily giving you lots of results. So I don't think it's hard to imagine how, to a certain degree, um, you can condense the number of hours that you need to learn and be more effective. So I do think that the 90 hours that you can get from this are equivalent not just to the 90 hours that you would get um, in, in university instruction, but perhaps to, uh, you would also be doing homework there, and if you took it into the second year, that would be another 90 hours. So with homework and, and things, you would be studying 270 or 360 hours in, in two years of college instruction. And I think that this can, could possibly be the equivalent of that. And I hit on 15 minutes, I think, because um, my main method, if it was available, has always been a senior books, which have about 100 different lessons in them. They do get progressively longer, but they're always relatively short. Um, but you have to go through each new lesson for a couple of times to get get the hang of it. Uh, and so 15 minutes is enough time to go through the new lesson, learn a new lesson, and to review some of the previous lessons, and so to make good systematic progress through a book like this. So um, that would have been my advice to you uh, before reading Atomic Habits, which is a huge bestseller, doesn't need me to promote it, but doesn't mean that everybody's heard of it. It's, it's a book about um, breaking habits, making habits, what it takes to really get new habits to work. Basically, what Clear says is that perhaps something like that, okay, just go do 15 minutes. That sounds like Nike's advice. Just just try it. Maybe that's too much at first. If you haven't, I can say that because I've, I've done it many times before, but if you haven't, uh, to find that time, to devote that time, and to sit down and actually do it um, might be asking too much all at once. I'm going to commence this discussion with a quotation from the younger brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. This is an obscure source. If you're not a personal friend of mine, you've probably never heard it mentioned in a single conversation that Napoleon Bonaparte had a younger brother. But on the other hand, if you are one of my personal friends, you're probably somewhat tired of hearing about Napoleon Bonaparte's younger brother, or you might even be tired. You might be overly familiar with this particular quotation. So I'm going to start by reading this to you somewhat modernized, somewhat rephrasing it to sound like natural English in the 21st century, and then I will read it to you verbatim. I wanted to be fair in my criticism of him, but the cheering of the crowd made me more violently excoriate 
and reproach him word by word. For the first time, I experienced how much the passions of those who listen have power over those who speak. I'm quoting this at the start of this video because I think that Professor Arguey, Alexander Arguey, is a fascinating example of a man who has been utterly corrupted by the adoration of the crowd, that the listeners have corrupted the message of the speaker, that the relationship of master to pupil, teacher to student, has been in a subtle way perverted. I think it's tremendously important to understand this process. As social media begins to devour formal education, and as social media begins to devour politics and activism of any kind, more and more of the relationships of master to pupil, shall we say, that they now exist here on YouTube or on other platforms through other media that really are fundamentally the same as the interface we have for YouTube. So to read this exactly as it was written in English, it wasn't written in French by Napoleon's younger brother, quote, I wished to keep fair with him, but the acclamations from the galleries augmented in proportion to the violence of my words. And for the first time, I experienced how much the passions of those who listen have power over those who speak. The problem with Alexander Argay is that he is telling you precisely what you want to hear. I do not believe anyone is paying him. I don't think there's any mechanism of corruption other than precisely the one I just described. Now, I'm making no claims. I may, there's no innuendo here about Professor Argay's sex life. I have known many, many professors with PhDs whose heads are turned, whose heart beats faster for an attractive younger woman just to pay attention to them, just to be interested in their research, just to be interested in hearing them talk about their lives, just to meet in their office with them. And I have known some professors where it is instead the interest and sympathy of attractive young men. They are gay. You know, it's the same dynamic playing out along a different combination of, of genders. I have always found it embarrassing when in the writings of some self-styled great man, they boast about how many young people these days are getting turned on by their groovy philosophy. Now, <laughs> I was scornfully mocking my own father for this at several points in my father's life. But uh, the final book my father wrote and published, to my eyes, there's some really embarrassing moments this way. I've seen it in many different fields, in many different disciplines. Well, the reality is someone spends their life toiling in obscurity, not getting much recognition or appreciation. That was not my father's problem, by the way. That was not his excuse, unfortunately. Most people with PhDs, they toil and labor in obscurity. And then they really are delighted. They really are pleased. If one day an attractive young man or an attractive young woman just seems interested, just seems enthusiastic, just seems to get it. And they may not realize the extent to which the listening of the crowd starts to shape the behavior and the message of the speaker. They may not realize that without being paid, without being seduced, without even sleeping with any of these, you know, students, that they start to feel a tug at their heartstrings. They start to feel a kind of gravitic pull to say the things that the people in the audience want to hear. Now, I am at the opposite end of this spectrum, and it would be a long autobiographical digression for me to reflect on when exactly I, I had this realization, but it's a powerful and important realization for all of us, no matter what field, even if you're a taxi driver, whether you're a taxi driver or you're a creative writer or you're a political dissident or you're a language educator, no matter what 
field you walk in. Um, what would it say about me if my political philosophy were really what all the hip young teenagers were into? What would it say about me and my message if I told you, yeah, 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 you know, um, when I was in Cambodia, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, I gave lectures about history and politics and philosophy. Oh, and all the all the hip young teenagers were into it. Oh, yeah, I had a big, I had an enthusiastic audience of young people who really appreciated and were really, they were really into this groovy new philosophy I was uh, pronouncing as a sage on the stage. I did give lectures in Cambodia. People found them disturbing. People found them upsetting. They contained hard, jarring, uncomfortable truths that nobody wanted to hear. I got questions to the audience that are hostile. <laughs> You're welcome now too, by the way. <laughs> by all means, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe and leave a leave a well, don't do Q and A. This I mean, I'm I'm quite happy to deal with that hostility. And indeed, you know, it's memorable for me. Some of the questions I received from people in Cambodia who utterly despised what I had to say, those are things I'll positively carry with me for the rest of my life. Like I appreciate, I appreciate that criticism, even if it was really criticism of someone who couldn't comprehend what the point when I was making was, even if it was fundamentally stupid or irrelevant criticism. I get to take that with me for the rest of my life. And, oh, okay, that's how Cambodian people responded to uh, being confronted. Me. Okay. I gave lectures in London, England, and Cambridge, and Oxford. I gave lectures back when I was in Toronto. I'm sorry, I have a long life of lecturing that led up to my career here on YouTube. All this is before I started the YouTube channel. And I've, I've been giving a lot of lectures these last five years. If you take a look at my YouTube channel, or YouTube channels, plural, you'll, you'll see thousands of, of lectures. Okay? What would it say about me if I told you, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this lecture I gave in London, England, you know, all the hip young kids at the university, all the teenagers, they were really into it. They were really enthusiastic about it. No, no, I'm not sad that the message I have to deliver is disturbing and jarring and shocking to people. And in each one of those contexts, each milieu, if you like, there were extraordinary people who took me aside and told me that they thought I was an extraordinary person. I have had people say to me that they thought I was a genius. I have had people say to me that they thought I was one of the few geniuses for this generation who's going to shape uh, events to come. And so I've had people flatter me on many different levels in many different ways. Sometimes to do with the specific field I was giving a lecture in, sometimes much more, much more generally non-specific. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, lacking for flattery. Some of you in the audience right now, you may have had this experience. People sometimes write to me. And they say, hey, look, you know, that video you made. So let's let's give a let's give a disturbing example. Let's say something, hey, you know, that video you made criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement. That really meant a lot to me. That really, you know, like, you know, you're not an idiot, you're not a right winger, you're not a right, like here was someone with a really intelligent, nuanced perspective that criticized Black Lives Matter. I could give a thousand examples for thousand. What I say back to these people commonly, so many of you may have had an email like this, I'm gonna say. Ah, you know, you're writing and saying to me in whatever flattering terms that I'm an extraordinary person for having made this video. But what I have to say to you is you're an extraordinary person because you could appreciate it. Do you have any idea what percentage of people watch this video and are just horrified? And they just they just can't hear it. They just can't listen to it. When you give a lecture live in Ford of Crowd, I, I don't I've never had someone stand up and walk out. I've never had someone actually walk out of the the lecture hall when I was giving a lecture, not, e not even on Buddhist philosophy or anything of, of the different fields on YouTube. It's really easy to walk. <laughs> you know, like you can watch someone for 30 seconds or five minutes. You can get up and leave. <laughs> um, you know, in this way, the intellectuals of our time, when they're boasting, 
they're really offering an indictment of themselves. You know, I can give many different examples of different times. What I had to say about the history of the French Empire in Cambodia, French imperialism, right? I was surprised when I had this experience. I wasn't expecting this, all right? It was so shocking and so disturbing to the establishment of people who had PhDs, people who were in scholarly institutes that were either in Cambodia or they're flying back and forth between Paris and Cambodia, all right, that they all joined forces against me and they prevented it from being published when the editor of the journal wanted to publish it. And they said, no, they had multiple meetings about this, apparently, where they discussed it, they discussed the article and they discussed me, they said, no, we can't let this pass. We can't let this go into, go into print, you know, and that that's stunning to me. I'd have to get into a lot of details of why that was so surprising. It's much less surprising to me that, you know, I want to write an article talking about the history of slavery in Buddhism and Buddhists do not want that article to be published. I want to do research on these kinds of things. Look, it's not going to hurt the Buddhist religion. <laughs> but this is research about something and Buddhists, true believing members of the faith, they don't even want to admit it exists. They don't want to solve the problem they don't want to acknowledge there is a problem or was a problem. Right? That's less. That's less surprising in an overtly religious context of what you can get away with in terms of critique of religion and, and discussion of of history. What if I were the sort of person, the sort of intellectual, the sort of author, the sort of researcher, the sort of YouTuber who is here saying to you, "Oh yeah, what I had to say in Cambodia, it was a big hit with the French academics with PhDs." who are still making excuses to support French imperialism, to glorify the memory of the French empire to this day. What if I were saying to you, oh, and that's how I got ahead. I was such a darling. All those people invited me to enroll in their PhD programs in Paris and Berlin. What I had to say was so popular. It was so acceptable. It was so welcome, such welcome news to people in authority, to members of the establishment. What if I was saying, to you, oh yeah, you know, I've also published newspaper articles in a lot of these places. The newspaper articles I published in Laos were shocking and disturbing, including the people in the government. The newspaper articles I published in Cambodia, uh, at least one was translated into Cambodian. I think two were translated into the Cambodian language, not, not by myself, by professional translators. Uh, and now, there were individuals, there were extraordinary individuals who recognized the importance of my work in Laos and Cambodia and all these places. And a lot of them said to me, hey, you're extraordinary. Whatever particular words they used to, they say, wow, you're this extraordinary intellectual. This is an extraordinary article. They're so happy to meet me. But a large part of what I have to say back is you may be ignoring the extent to which you are an extraordinary person because you opened that newspaper and you were prepared to read it. You were prepared to hear it. You attended that lecture. You were willing to listen then you had whatever it took, whether it's an emotional prerequisite or an intellectual prerequisite, you had what it took, you know, to really hear and understand and see the value in what I have to say. And that is not for the vast majority of teenagers. And it's not for the vast majority of middle-aged people. And it's not for the vast majority of graybeards. okay? The vast majority of elderly people also cannot appreciate and cannot sympathize with what I have to say, all right? If I go and give a lecture at a polyglot conference like Alexander Argay, right, I will not be cheered by the crowd, all right? What I have to say about language education, what I have to say about the life of the mind, being an intellectual, being an author, being a researcher, you know, what I have to say under any of these topics it's not popular. It's never going to be popular. And I am not in a position to apologize for that or to feel ashamed. What is the lie Alexander Argay is selling? Well, he tells you that if you study for just 15 minutes per day, and he lets you know that it might be too much for you to start with 15 minutes per day. 
you maybe have to start with five minutes or even less and work your, work your way up to it. If in the fullness of time, you can cultivate the habit and commit to study for just 15 minutes a day, you can accomplish more in one year than a university student, a full-time university student enrolled in the study of these languages. Now, I am understating the grandiosity of the promises he makes, of the enticements he offers you, if you will just study language using his method, following his formula. So let's say here, um, think of the pressure an 18-year-old feels when studying for an exam. Now, correct me wrong, people start university around age 18 these days. I think that's the normal age now. Okay. For a lot of you, this is a, um, oh, great question. <laughs> I'll interrupt myself. Someone asked when, uh, when is No More Manifestos coming out? So I'm publishing one book, uh, maybe even tomorrow or the next day, but just in the next few days, I'm publishing Future of an Illusion. And I've, I've basically taken a break from finishing No More Manifestos to write and publish this book, uh, Veganism, Colon, The Future of an Illusion. And then I'm going to um, finalize the final manuscript for No More Manifestos, and it'll be on uh, Amazon soon thereafter. But right now, that's my only priority, is finishing and publishing those, those two books. Anyway, we have confirmation. It's normal to begin going to university age 18. So for a lot of you, uh, for Professor Argoy himself, it may be a very distant, difficult memory for you to really think back on the fear and trembling you once had when studying for an exam, when writing the exam, maybe when receiving the test results back, when they handed you the grade, when you really didn't know if you were going to fail this course, or at the other end, you're trying to get an A plus, and you don't know if you're going to get an A plus or an A minus, or B, you know you don't know how how well you're going to do. The fear, the pressure of being in a university course, of having your parents tell you you are the first child in this family to have the opportunity to go to university. Your father saved up money for 20 years, since before you were born, we started saving. So you could have this opportunity to go to university. You better not screw up. Okay. Or maybe you personally went into debt. You took out a loan. Maybe your parents didn't save any money, but you signed up for one of those, one of those loans. Okay. Now, a lot of professors forget this. A lot of professors forget the turmoil. Sitting at your own desk with your own copy of a pamphlet to memorize vocabulary for 15 minutes a day with no deadline, with no evaluation, with no exam, right? Even if this were the only factor we were taking into consideration here, right? It could never possibly be as powerful a language learning tool as the university course. I wish I could tell you that in my experience, 90% of university language courses are bullshit. In my experience, it's 100%. They're all bad. They're all terrible. I don't know of any exceptions anywhere in the world. And I talked to everyone I possibly could. I've talked to and visited universities in Europe, in Asia, in North America. Admittedly, for example, never Mexico, never Latin America. You know, like there are parts of the world where I don't know how they teach languages, but I have looked into formal classroom language education all over the world. Not Africa, you know, there are, there are blind spots. Interestingly, also Israel. I looked into how the Hebrew language is taught in Israel. It's remarkably bad. I am not holding up the university classroom as a standard of excellence. From my perspective, the way languages are taught and learned and forgotten in universities is a standard of awfulness. There's a tremendously important uh, critique of university education and of how little anyone learns at such a tremendous cost. All right. But I am saying that the method endorsed by Professor Arguy is worse. It's worse than the low standard set by universities. Now, if you want to be muscular. 
there were many things I could lie to you about to make money. There are many ways I can monetize my advice or encouragement for you to start living way. But I think the most fundamental is time. Right? There are days, I mean, right now, I'm, I'm no great paragon of beauty. There are days when I spend three hours exercising. You know, if we include the long walks we take, and I take walks of maybe 30 pounds in a backpack. I don't even know if it's 30 pounds. But I have a very heavy backpack, backpack full of rocks, in effect. Um, we do these long walks. That can be an hour. And I can spend two hours at the gym. I could sit here and tell you it's nothing. I could sit here and tell you that that hasn't delayed the publication of my forthcoming book, No More Manifestos. I could sit here and say it hasn't delayed the publication of my forthcoming book, you know, Future of an Illusion. It has. Days on which I spend three hours exercising. The loss of productive mental time I have is much more than three hours. All right. I, I do not generally snap into, say, writing or editing the book and snap out of it. It's not that fast. It's not that easy to, you know, this is a real idiom in English, to get into the groove, to get into the flow of whatever kind of work it is you're doing. I, I would I would really have gotten much more done the past two years if I completely neglected my physical health. If I just hunched over the typewriter and worked continuously in that flow. It's a sacrifice. It's a real sacrifice. Guys, I do 200 push-ups per session. The push-ups themselves take very little time, all right? There are many of you in the audience, and you can stop and ask yourself, from your current level of fitness, what if you wanted to get on my level, where you can, without exhausting yourself, without it being such a big deal, you can do 200 push-ups, okay? Now, what if I'm looking at the possibility of going from my current level of fitness to being a middle-aged Instagram model? Like, I want to really be so fit that, I don't know, it's going to help sell copies of my, my forthcoming book, all right? The most important thing to be honest about is time. One of the reasons for that is because time is true for everyone, regardless of your psychological or emotional character. Now, Melissa's sitting here. You can, you can jump in, but, you know, do you, do you have an estimate for how many hours you spent studying Chinese? In the last year, I, I like I, I'm not asking you to have memorized it, but like have because I know you've been tracking a lot of your a lot of your time. So Melissa off camera has been learning Chinese. I I know, but like let let's just say at a minimum, look, I think a lot of days it's four hours out of the day lately, lately. Now of course maybe that's not seven days a week, but it's easy. So I'm not going to describe her method here, but. I think I think you could, even if it's not for the whole last two years, for the last six months, I don't think it would be unreasonable talking about four hours a day. Because some days it's more than four hours. And some days it's less, but yeah. Okay, four hours a day. All right. Now, first note, that's the same for everyone. Lifting weights at the gym. You know what's not the same for everyone? How you cope with the stress how you deal with it emotionally and intellectually, all right? <laughs> um, you know, like at the gym, 10 different people can put in the exact same amount of work. They can lift the same amount of weight for the same amount of reps. Now, what most people pay attention to is the difference in their results, like the actual amount of muscle they gain or the amount of fat they lose. That's not going to be the same for all 10 people, okay? How about the number of hours of sleep they're getting? All right. One of the reasons why I don't push myself beyond a certain point in exercise, this happens most often actually with the muscles in my legs. If I push myself too hard, I don't sleep that night. And I don't even, I don't feel bad. So with exercise, physical, I don't feel anguished. I don't feel upset. Right? I just don't sleep. And I can even, you know, I can even kind of enjoy my life that way. I mean, it's a lot harder if you're a parent taking care of a kid or, I don't know, you know, it depends what else you've got going on. 
But like for me, if I really lose a whole night's sleep, which happens sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm, I basically sleep for one hour or two hours in the night and it, having your muscles all pumped up and all strung out, I, you can lose a night's sleep, you know? Um, and, and trust me, it's not that I'm using steroids. <laughs> Not, you know, it's not once you get to that, we have a whole nother level of questions. We're just talking about natural exercise here. Okay. For those 10 people, if we do an experiment where they all do exactly the same exercise, same reps, same weight, the knock on effects psychologically, emotionally, and in terms of their sleep cycle are going to be different. Okay. I know what it's like to lose sleep because you're learning a language. I know what it's like to push yourself so hard that you're cracking up. Okay. I know what it's like to push yourself against those limits. I know what it's like to be sweating at your desk and have the sweat literally pour down your pencil and make the pencil impossible to use because the, the tip of the pencil got wet. And I know what it's like to break down weeping at your desk. And it's, it's just weeping out of stress. I mean, really, you know what I mean? Like not because someone's been been mean to you. Okay. I know what it's like to absolutely push yourself to the limit where you're waking up at 5 30 in the morning to study Chinese before a class that starts at nine in the morning, you know, so you can wake up, eat and like study for an hour before you get in the bus. However, it works out. You know, I know what it's like where you're dreaming or having nightmares in that language, whatever your target language is. And I know what it's like to study more than one language at the same time, okay? I know what those upper limits are like, okay? And I know most of you can't cope with that. <laughs> I know that most human beings would cope with that far, far worse than I did. <laughs> and I know that most human beings even when they are placed in the most encouraging circumstances, whether that be in a university program or a military program or a new immigration and adjustment program, like when they really have an institution helping them learn the language and rewarding them for learning language, or when they're married to someone who is loving and caring and encouraging and helping them learn the language. It's very common. You marry someone and they teach you a language or learn a language with you, you have that kind of thing. All right. I had none of these circumstances. I was in really, really tough conditions. I, I could now list off all the languages I've studied. It's a long list and how horrible the conditions I was in. It's irrelevant. What I have seen again and again is that even people who have, shall we say, the most uh, velvet lined manacles, you know, they are, they're in the most luxuriant of prisons in a PhD program, for example, okay, the vast majority of them could not do what I did in a fucking tent with no electricity and a flashlight under a mosquito net, like under really hard conditions. You could tell a million different anecdotes about this, but... <laughs> I do have a friend now who teaches German at a university in the United States of America. She complains to me and sometimes sends me funny kind of screenshots and pictures related to how awful her job is. There are a lot of different things you could say about this. She has a lot of experience teaching different people at different ages. If your first language is English, one of the easiest languages you could possibly learn is German. Okay, learning German compared to Chinese compared to Cambodian, compared to Laotian, compared to Pali, you know, Sanskrit, whatever. <laughs> I mean, um, German is one of the easiest languages you could, you could possibly learn, all right? I think one of the most fundamental problems is that her students are poisoned by the notion that all they have to do is 15 minutes a day, all right? Now, even for German, even for German, you have to live the training. You know, you have to do written composition and listening comprehension and just repetition again and again and again until you reach a point where the rules of grammar come to you automatically. You know, it doesn't 
It doesn't occur to you to use the wrong gender. It doesn't occur to you to have the wrong verb ending or adjective ending. You don't have to think about it in terms of rules because you have put in those hours. And that's going to be far, far more than the minimum number of hours required by a uh, by university program, right? I mean, the, the level of sacrifice, the level of work. Now, when you really understand how awful that is, a lot of people, they probably shouldn't be studying German at all. Probably a lot of people are signing up with the kind of encouragement, with the kind of bad advice uh, Professor Argay gives you. And they think, oh, it'll be no big deal. I'll just learn some German. It'll be fun. It'll, you know, it'll expand my horizons. So, and, it, you know, I mean, look, my problem in life really is not with tourists who have casually attempted to learn a language for a couple of years and have failed. What I have seen are the people with PhDs themselves, the people who become professors themselves, that they never learned the basics. I mean the basics, not just that they fail to achieve, you know, advanced levels of competence in these languages. I think our university language education system, it is rotten from root to branch. But the people at the top, they can be the most rotten of all. Now, I have written to Professor Argay several times. A couple of my comments were deleted and he didn't reply to you. But one of them, uh, now, by the way, I believe, I've seen a lot of evidence for this, I believe he actually does read every single comment he gets on his YouTube channel. He replies to many, but sometimes he replies and sometimes he deletes it and decides not to reply. That seems to be his style. I'm not holding against him. Whether or not he will see this video, whether or not he will hear this critique is quite another matter. The way that Professor Argay has responded to this is by the simple use of weasel words. You know, is say, well, I didn't promise you that the results you would get would be just as good doing 15 minutes a day as they would be in a university course. You know, right. So you can go back and look at the precise wording he used, and you can decide for yourself whether or not there's any wiggle room uh, whatsoever. Now, You know, I've seen books for sale. Learn a language in 10 days. Learn a language in five days. Learn a language in two weeks. Learn a language in, in six months. You know, um, there are ways in which you can say this kind of fraud isn't new. Okay. What's new is people in positions of power and privilege like you. Professor Argay, that you have become a snake oil salesman. You are supposed to represent a standard of excellence. Say this about all university professors. You are supposed to represent something better than the huckster on the street who stands there and sells snake oil, who stands there and tells people whatever they want to hear just to make a buck in the short term. Right? You're supposed to be better than a private for profit language tutor or private for profit book publishing company where they think they're going to sell more books by trying to make you trying to convince people in the audience, people in the market that it's going to be so easy and so rapid for them to learn this language. It is your role as a professor to tell one incoming generation of students after another. No, if you want to do this, if you want to learn Latin and you want to have your Latin on this level, so you can have this career in the next four years. Here's how much work it's going to be. Here's the sacrifice you're going to make. And you got to give them advice further. If you get to the halfway point, if you're two years into Latin and you can't do this, this, and this at this level of competence, this level of ability, then you're going to have to take a gap year. You're going to have to stop and you're going to have to go work your ass off 24 seven for 365 days. So you can get to where you need to be before you go into the third year. Right? I could repeat this for German. I could repeat this for Chinese. I could repeat this for any language. That's a, it is your job to give people, to tell people what they don't want to hear, to give them the advice that, you know, and look, you know, ultimately these things do come down to quantitative measurements. 
how much competence do your students have after four years? In most programs, it's it's practically zero. So I've I've posted articles about this on the internet in the past. When you look at okay, the average American university student who has quote unquote four years of education in Chinese in a BA program in the United States of America, at the end of that, can they even speak in simple, complete sentences? Can they do this? Can they do that? The actual level of language competence produced by this is is almost nothing. Okay. So what's the road ahead? Lying? Is that how we're going to solve this problem? <laughs> By lying about it? Oh, I've known quite a few professors who slept with their students. I knew one guy, and um, he was married. They were a young couple, and he was very athletic, which is unusual for someone with a PhD. And he was also, he was one of these white guys who had converted to Christianity. So like, I'm guessing his family were atheists or just culturally Christian, but he had an epiphany. He'd become uh, fanatically Christian after eating, falling in love with and marrying his wife. His wife wasn't it. Spoilers, he ended up cheating on his wife and he cheated on her by sleeping with one of the students. He was a university professor. At a, <laughs> to call it a love affair would be an exaggeration. This example is memorable to me for many reasons. His method of informing his wife was to send her a text message to her mobile phone um, I, so in those days, text messages had a limited number of characters, limited number of words. I don't know if that's changed. Can you now, I think you can send now a paragraph. You can send quite a long text message. But this text message was something like, you know, slept with students, am leaving you, file for divorce. It was this kind of literary masterpiece. You know, and the fact that this was done by text message at all, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of ways to let your wife know you've been cheating on them. Oh, there are also a lot of ways to let your wife know that you violated your own code of conduct, your own standard, standards of duty and, and professionalism that you're, you know, you're, the, the, to, to, you failed to uphold the code that you swore you would live by. Right or wrong, you took that vow. Um... I knew another professor. <laughs> I don't know how he got away with this when you think about it. He was married and he started sleeping with the uh, secretary in the university department who was much younger than him and much younger than his wife. She wasn't a student, but she was a secretary. It's also forbidden. And one day, mysteriously, he wasn't married to his wife anymore. He was married to the secretary. <laughs> you know, so I've known a lot of combinations and, and permutations um, of this kind. However, you know, as bad and bleak as that may be, as dark and negative as the consequences may be, you know, you can say that this belongs in a very different category from the men who are their whole lives subject to a kind of suasion from women they never seduce and who never seduce them back. You know, men who are forever you know, being led by their nose. Men who are willing to watch a YouTube channel and lie to themselves that the woman speaking is really very intelligent or very well informed just because she's good looking. And of course, we can repeat all of this with a female protagonist in relation to a male. Isn't it easy to tell yourself? Isn't it easy to interpret in the most generous way possible something stupid that somebody said? Make yourself think this person is more intelligent than they are because you find them attractive. Um, university professors, perhaps especially language instructors, all right? These people feel like losers. They feel like they could never get the prettiest girl in their high school. They could never get the prettiest girl in the university. 
They feel that nobody appreciates them. Nobody understands their brilliance. Nobody understands the importance of what they do, right? And we're up against some hard facts of human biology here. You know, we're up against the fact that you, whether you are a male professor or a female professor, you are in your 30s, you're in your 40s, your 50s, or your 60s, it doesn't turn off, you know, and you're meeting people who are 18 to 25, right? In contrast mm. to the professor who actually cheats on his wife and ruins his marriage, or in contrast to the professor who cheats on his wife and ruins his career, like who sleeps with a student and ends up, you know, they're they're fired and their their reputation is ruined. They have those consequences. All right. There's a much larger number of professors who are at all times pandering to their students, where instead of the students seeking the approval of the professor, it is the professor who is seeking the approval of his or her students. Is it sometimes uh, due to a sincere sense of intellectual camaraderie between a professor and a student? No, never. It's always this shallow. It's always this dark. It's always this bad. I'm going to tell you why. If these people were capable of that kind of intellectual camaraderie, whether with someone younger or someone older, they would not be a pawn in that professorial game. They would not be on that position or it would not last long. They would very soon be moving on to other kinds of endeavors, working with those people with whom they had that kind of sincere intellectual camaraderie, that working with their, their colleagues. If you're professors at your, at your university, you know, let, let's, let's just say it's English literature as an example. Just this is easy to visualize, but we could repeat this for language learning, for all kinds of things. Did you ever hear of a professor who met a talented student and, let, and where there's no sex involved, like it's a heterosexual man and a heterosexual man or whatever, or it's a gay man and a woman, but whatever, where there's no sex. Involved. Have you ever heard of a professor who met a really talented, bright student and said, hey, you know what? You and me, we should become the editors of a new magazine of a new literary journal. We should really get something started. You know, hey, you know what? You have a really great critical perspective on theater, on drama. We got to start publishing this. It would cost them nothing. For these people, if you have a if you have a seat in a university, if you have a permanent job, do you know how little that would take for a professor to actively recruit talent, actively work with talent, actively start a journal? Do you know how little it would take for a professor to start their own language institute? independent from the university to start employing some of their former students as instructors and teachers to put together their own package and start paying their employees and paying themselves much more than they make inside the university system. Do you know, if you have any entrepreneurial zeal, if you have any capacity to appreciate intellectual talent in others and where it really is, you know, being their colleague, being their comrade, not sexually exploiting them, not um, affirming your own ego, you know, not trying to make yourself feel better about your own uh, lost youth, wasted and abandoned aspirations and so on, not trying to compensate for your sense that nobody's ever appreciated your intelligence, your brilliance, or what you could have done with your life. Because professors do exploit students in exactly that way. And the shrewder students they learn how to exploit the professor's back, right? There are students who in a very canny way, they recognize, okay, the professor represents this obscure school of feminist, radical leftist philosophy. So I'm going to go up to the professor and say, hey, I read your paper about Deleuze and I really agree with you. <laughs> I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that this professor's particular political philosophy or particular methodology, that it really appeals to me. And in this way, many of the shrewder students, they pander to the professors and the professors uh, pander back. Okay. Wouldn't it be different to live in a world where the relationship 
between professor and student and the relationship between leader and follower. We have here more vaguely with Alexander Argoy and his status in the polyglot uh, community, polyglot internet phenomenon. Wouldn't it be different if these relationships were built on outcomes? Measurable outcomes. Hmm? What if it had nothing to do with who you like, who you're attracted to, who you feel flattered by, who you get along with, right? What if these were actually productive working relationships of people who are trying to learn a language, people who are trying to teach a language, and people who are trying to do something to uh, create a future for the discipline or movement that they see themselves being a part of. Now, I'm going to give you a tiny little example, and then we'll just come back to language education. And from my perspective, that's a wrap. Um, I asked one professor after another in Buddhist studies, but what are you doing for the future of the discipline? Now, these are very different people. Some of these people were ethnically Chinese and born and raised in China. Some of these people were white and born and raised in Europe. Like some of these people were from India or Sri Lanka. They were really different people. But what they all had in common was that their approach to education, their approach to philosophy, their approach to politics, their approach to using the position of authority and privilege they really have as university professors was 100% self-centered, 100% self-pitying, 100% short-term self-indulgence. And they would be shocked. They had never thought of it before. When I said to them, well, yeah, but if this is how you run your Department of Buddhist Studies, if this is like who you exclude and who you recruit, and this is what you teach, and this is what you refuse to deal with, and this is the research you refuse to let happen, and this is the research, like, this is what's going on, right? Like, I understand that's easiest for you now. Like, <laughs> I understand you're, you're eliminating problems you don't want to deal with this way. But okay, 10 years from now, what's going to happen in the discipline? Like, the people who are your students today, they will be professors just 10 years from now. It's not that long down the road, right? So if you're not recruiting talent, if you're not doing something positive, if you're not creating the basis for the future of the discipline, right? What's, what's going to happen to it, you know? Now, as I say, their, their responses were incredibly stupid. But the most important thing of all was just they had never thought of this before. They, like, I, I think it would be an insult to long-term thinking to say that they lacked long-term thinking. They were not even thinking five years ahead they were not thinking 10 years ahead. Now, this comes back to language learning in a very direct way. Like you're in a department of Buddhist studies and you say, okay, if nobody can learn Pali, if nobody can learn Sanskrit, if nobody can learn Tibetan in this department, like you have all these things you can't do, where are we going to be 10 years from now? Like I understand the easiest thing for you to do and maybe also financially the most profitable thing for you to do is just to have like yoga classes, just to have people come in and talk about, you know, your aura and breathing exercises. Talk about the same crap that they'd hear on a, on a podcast about meditation and yoga and Eastern spirituality. Like, okay, I understand. Like, that's probably what the students are expecting. The students' parents are probably happy to pay for it. Everyone's happy to get an A- minus or whatever with minimum effort. Like, you know, that the courses are not going to be that, that rigorous or difficult. Like, I understand. Short term, this may... this Okay. To be blunt... What about the extraordinary students like myself? What about the students who are really committed to this for the next 10 years, next 20 years, the rest of our lives, where what we need is the preparation to have a career in this field, in this discipline, and we can't get anything. We need. On the contrary, you've actually created a milieu. You've created a kind of intellectual context that's quite hostile to us, that excludes us, that excludes the tiny number of students who want to talk about the history of slavery, who want to talk about the history of war and racism and, you know, students who are actually interested in reading the scientific evidence that meditation doesn't work. Students who are willing to talk about and do research about and write essays about 
corruption scandals than Buddhism, sex scandals than Buddhism. Yes, yes, y'all. It's not just the Catholic Church, right? You know, well, we, and I don't, I don't know any one of them myself. <laughs> it's not a whole lot of us. You know, we, people like that, right? Like it or not, we are the future of the discipline, right? And there's a really weird sense in which this whole university system, it just exists for us. Language education. I've studied many different languages in many different institutions. All right. So once in a charming little town called Saskatchewan, don't try to spell it. I was in Saskatchewan studying Cree and Ojibwe. Nehiawewin. Yeah. Um, I say Cree and Ojibwe because the program covered both. Nehiawewin is just the indigenous word for Cree. All right. Now, what's the easy way? to teach those courses. You have a Cree language course. If you think learning German is hard, try studying Cree, right? Try studying a really foreign language, okay? <laughs> Talk about languages you cannot learn from a mobile phone app, <laughs> okay? Well, you know, the easy way to do it actually has a lot in common with what I was just saying about Buddhism. Cultural dancing, music, playing a drum, storytelling, right? How about you learn some magic words from the religion? How about you go out and tour some sites like you have a field trip? You know what I'm saying? How about you go and see some ancient sacred paintings on a rock? And then on the exam, what's the word for sacred rock? Like, you can dumb this all the way down. And all the students are happy and all the students' parents are happy. And by the way, some of the students are white. They're taking, they're, they're interested in a kind of cultural sensitivity course for the relationship between white people and the indigenous people. They've driven to the brink of extinction. Yeah. But a lot of them ethnically are Cree or Ojibwe. They're ethnically First Nations people, but they have no connection to the language, the culture, the history. They've, you know, they've grown up in a colonized modern world. You know, they've grown up in, 21st century Canada, right? A lot of them may be totally happy with that too. They don't really want to sit and memorize verb endings. They don't want to drill sentence structure. They don't want to learn grammar and they don't want to do written compositions. That's really, that's really hard work, right? Okay. So you, you it's in everybody's, you just keep dumbing it down. What's, and what's the most convenient lie of all? 15 minutes a week, 15 minutes, all it takes 15 minutes. You can do it, you know. I mean, what's most convenient is to lie that at the end of this course, you're going to be able to speak the language. Or at the end of four years of doing this. You're going to, okay, there are all kinds of ways to make language education entertaining and fun. I could say this about working out at the gym. There are ways to make lifting weights entertaining and fun, and they don't work, okay? Weightlifting is pain. Exercise is suffering. Period. Okay. And like, no matter how careful you are, there are going to be nights where you, you, you only, you lose a whole night's sleep. You know, you're up on just cause you have twitching tight muscles, not even an injury. You're just so pumped up or your whatever your cortisol levels, whatever the hell it is. You know, when, when you are lifting weights, no matter how safe, no matter how careful. All right. There's no way to make this harmless and easy and quick and fun and entertaining. It's hours, it's sweat, it's tears, it's suffering. And the problem is when you dumb down language education, all right, you hurt the people like me. You hurt exactly the people this institution, this multi-million dollar institution was created to help and you ruin the future of your own discipline. Okay. If you have that one person in a million who really has the talent, the experience, and the motivation to sit down and do the hard work of learning the language, what happens to them when they show up and the whole institution has been corrupted by the philosophy of Alexander Argay, when it's been corrupted by this process whereby the professors begin to pander to the students? They just want to do whatever's hip and groovy and popular 
with the students. They want to give lectures that the students find funny and entertaining and uplifting. And, you know, they don't, they don't want to be the mean, bad professor where the professors have completely bought into this process of, of, of lowering the standards, right? Okay. Whether the students are one in a million or one in 10,000, whatever it is, you have someone who shows up and says, look, I made these sacrifices. I rented a new home. I moved across the country. In my case, I moved across the world. I came here to learn this language now. Like I don't have 20 years. I don't have a $2 million. I have a certain amount of money I've spent on tuition, a certain amount of money I'm spending on rent. And I, I, I am here to create the foundation for the rest of my career in this language. And I need you to help me. And what are you doing? All right. You have corrupted this whole institution, precisely the resources, precisely the courses, precisely the teaching and training that's supposed to be here to help me, right? Instead, and if any of you live through this, you've seen this, instead you've created a situation that's actually hostile towards me, that's actually punishing me because I'm the one person putting up their hand who actually wants to learn the grammar. I'm the only person who's trying to speak in a complete sentence or write a sentence or learn the vocabulary, right? I'm the only person who isn't dragging those standards down even lower. And let me ask you this, Professor Argay. You know, where does the bullshit stop? I have a friend who became a nurse. I've had several friends who are nurses. I, I think I have at least two right now who are nurses, actually. Um, but I have a friend who became a nurse during the years I knew him. He took all the exams and so on and so forth. Uh, quite a long process over, over many years. You know what? There are a lot of really stupid, really lazy people who become nurses. And he's been in the classroom with them. He's been in the classroom with people who are only motivated by the money. They they. They've probably been told this since they were a child by their parents or grandparents. Oh, you know, be a nurse, get a get a steady check every month. There, he's been in the classroom. I and mean, I remember this from when I was a teenager. There's a certain kind of good-looking, lazy, not particularly intelligent woman. And, you know, she was looking at different career paths. Okay, working in the nail salon, esthetician, uh dental assistant, you know, receptionist, and somehow they settled on nurse, you know, but where they're, they're just that kind of person. They have no interest in the medical science or excellence. They have no interest in the future of the discipline. And the, they're in the classroom trying to do the bare minimum. All right. Um, there are also people who go into nursing as a midlife career change. A lot of other kind of stereotypes to unpack in terms of who is in that classroom and why, with what motivations. Do you think you can learn how to be a nurse in 15 minutes a day? No exams, no pressure. It is so much easier in your own native language to learn everything you know to be a nurse than it is to become fluent in the Chinese language, than it is to become fluent in the Japanese language, in the Cree language, in the Ojibwe language. Okay. <laughs> the sad irony is I actually think you could learn to become a nurse in 15 minutes a day. <laughs> but even if it is possible, Whereas I'm saying it's impossible to learn Chinese that way. The last thing we need are people in positions of power like you, Dr. Arkay, dumbing down the institutions, lowering the standards, pandering to the audience, telling them what they want to hear, and encouraging them to think this is going to be a very low level of sacrifice and a very low level of self-discipline for a huge 
and a media warlord. What you need are professors who stand up and say to those nursing students when they come in, look, this is how much time it's going to take just to do the bare minimum. This is how much time it's going to take to be adequate. If you can't do this, this, and this at a level of excellence after six months in the program or two years in the program, whatever it is, you need to stop. You need to drop out and enroll in a totally different major, become an x-ray technician because you can't do the job. Or you need to take a gap year, you know, keep the books with you. Like, you know, go stay in a cabin in the woods and study for 365 days a year, you know, 12 hours a day. You need to catch up. This is what's required of you. And if you're not good enough or if you're not putting in the time, if you're not putting in the effort to reach that level of excellence, you fail. This is not because I'm glorifying the fear of failure. All right. If you don't do that, what do you produce? What is the future of the nursing discipline going to be as you embrace lower and lower standards of stupider and stupider and more self-indulgent people who call themselves nurses, but who do not, in fact, have any of the competence that defines that field. Now, Melissa, you have not had a lot of opportunities to talk. <laughs> do you want do you want to jump in and say a few words? I, there are some questions and comments from the audience. If you guys have anything to say, um, now's the time to say something, and I'll actually. Uh... <laughs> no, three, three points, three points from that. Cool. <sighs> yeah. Well, William McGeehan says, just don't say that you're a very stable genius. That that catchphrase has already been taken by someone else. Yeah, that's a memorable one from, from Donald Trump. Um, well, look, you know, when people call you a genius, how are you going to react? When I was young, 16, 17, 18, 19, even 20, what I would say to them was, the only reason you're telling me that I'm a genius is because you don't want to help and I need help. And it did really happen in those circumstances. I'd go in to talk to a professor. This is a real example, but it's represented many. Go in and talk to a professor of economics and say, look, I don't have the background I need to do this math and nobody's going to help me. Like I didn't learn this in high school. I didn't learn this in primary school, whatever. I like, you know, I don't have the background of math to be doing this university level course in economics without help. I remember the particular professor, he was Jewish. I, I am a Jewish genetically. I'm not a member of the Jewish religion in any sense. And the first thing he said to me, you know, after I'd, made my introductions and explained that I needed help. He said, oh, you know, you must have grown up with someone speaking Yiddish in your family. You know, I can tell immediately from her voice, you're so eloquent, you're so well-spoken. This is saying not only that I must be Jewish, but that I must be from a you know, specific subculture within Judaism. And this, this professor, he was tremendously, and what he had to say to me was that I was obviously this very talented and very intelligent person, huh? I'm paying tens of thousands of dollars, right? Nobody's going to help. Like, I'm paying tens of thousands of dollars, and I've got to show up and write an exam. Either I already know how to do it, or I have a father or a brother who's going to teach me. There was, there was no education there to be had in economics, I mean, in that specific department that, that year at that time. You know, Now, a lot of language education departments like that, too. And I mean, that, so that was not the only situation like that, but it's like, okay, like I see how this works. And I don't think that professor was being insincere at all. I mean, I think, I think he was really genuinely flattering me. I think he was very impressed with talking to me about politics and economics. I think he really felt that I was the most intelligent and most interesting student he'd had in his office that day or that week, or maybe for a couple of years. Oh, wow. Here's a really bright, positively motivated kid who's interested in economics and politics. Like I can see why he'd respond to me positively, 
compared to the people I was sitting next to in class. Like, you know, I, I knew what most of my classmates were like compared to people who were just coming in and saying, Oh, I want a higher grade. Why can't you raise my grade? You know, there were some real, there were some real shlemiels. There were people with bad, with bad motivations there. Right. Um, so my point is not that these professors are being consciously and intentionally manipulative when they flatter you or nor the people generally, you know, but what I perceived was that, you know, when you say that I'm talented, when you say that I'm brilliant, if you say that I'm a genius, what you mean is you're not going to do anything to help. You are going to completely dismiss what I'm telling you the problem is and what I need help with. And you're going to you're going to go back to your wife or whatever tonight and say, you know, I met a really sharp kid today. That that kid's going places. And I'm here saying to you, no, I'm not. I'm here saying to you straight to your face, I'm dropping out of the program and I can't do this because the program you created is bad and deeply flawed, right? And that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's, that's the mismatch. So I had to start struggling with that early on. Now, look, some of you, you've never known what it's like to have a professor tell you that you're a genius. Some of you, like as a writer, You've never given your writing to an editor or something and had them say, and what doesn't matter if they use the word brilliant, say that this is whether or not they use the word genius or brilliant or whatever. You've never had those, those kinds of reactions. Well, I've, I've had flattery from editors who tell me they can't publish it too. Look, I can't publish this, but this is genius. This is brilliant. I want you to know, I don't take the time out of my day to talk to everybody. So this is a manuscript. This is, this is amazing research. This is amazing writing. You know, you, you get positive feedback. That's part of a rejection, you know. Now, unfortunately, politically, this is so provocative, we couldn't possibly publish it. You know, you can get you can get all that uh, all that feedback too. You know, I remember I've had very few conversations with my sister Beth in my whole life. Um, I have two sisters, you know, but in my whole life, I've spoken to Beth incredibly few times. And I remember a conversation with my sister where she was she was being so cruel to me and so vicious to me. My mother was there and and witnessed the whole thing. And um, anyway, I, I, obviously, I could tell this in greater detail. But after the conversation was over, you know, my mother said to me, like, don't you get it? The reason why she's mad at you is that none of her professors ever called her a genius. And like you casually in passing were mentioning like professors, you were criticized. Like, it's true. I was like complaining. I wasn't bragging about myself. I was complaining about how awful everything was at university. Uh, and I think at least one of the professors I was mentioning, um, y you know, she studied with the same professor, you know. Um, yeah, you know, well, guess what? She went on to get a PhD and I didn't. <laughs> I have no envy for her. She has a couple of YouTube videos up, guys. <laughs> if you want to know just how intellectually unimpressive my older sister is, if you want to know why none of the professors were calling her genius, but I remember her viciousness and her jealousy. And I've made other videos talking about this. But jealousy is very strange to me, right? Um, and I remember my mother seeing that and saying that when to me, like I it was totally alien because I wasn't, I wasn't boasting. I was, I was complaining. It was related to what I've just said. Like, look, these professors praise you, but the reality is like, you can't actually learn the language. You can't do this. You can't do that. Like the, the system is broken. And by praising you, they're writing you off. They're throwing you into the dustbin of history. Or whatever you want to say. They're discarding you while telling you that you're a genius. Like this is, this is the kind of thing I'm complaining about. But that that in itself, you know, my sister couldn't, couldn't cope with. That that excited too much jealousy. And in, in many ways, I mean, she was intensely jealous of me her whole life. I think she still is. <laughs> and who can blame her? <laughs> um... This is a little bit of a digression from a digression. Um, you know, it's easy to give advice that presumes someone is on your level. And it's a lot harder and it's not a lot more humiliating to really cast your mind back and remember what help and what advice you needed when you were at their level. So I do this a lot. I mean, I'm a very self-critical person this way, but like, I remember how stupid I was. And I like, I, I remember it in a way where you're really living through it again. You're feeling that discomfort 
I remember how stupid it was. I remember how ignorant I was. I remember the misconceptions I had when I first started studying the Korean language, when I first studied studying the Chinese language, but this is not in order. Uh, when I first started studying Korean Ojibwe, like I can remember the hopes and dreams side with each language, but I can remember, you know, like I remember my own enthusiasm, like you could say it that way, but like to really inhabit that memory where you deal with and confront and feel like how vulnerable you were at that time, how much you needed help. And, and maybe you didn't even know how to ask for the help you needed. Now, so for me, one language after another, you know, when, when I first started studying Korean, I didn't know what to ask for help. I didn't know what help to ask for. But sure, when you're dealing with languages later, I knew exactly what help to ask for. I knew exactly what I needed to do because I'd studied six other languages already or something. You know, I could, you know, obviously, this, and, I, and I was getting older and more mature. Um, yeah. So look, I mean, I think, I think what I'm doing here is uniting two seemingly unrelated points. Okay, people see you as a genius. People see you as talented. People say to your face, Kid, you're going someplace. You're going to have no problems in life. Like, you don't need my help. But that's, people say to me my whole fucking life. <laughs> and I'm saying, no, like, I need help. I'm failing. And, you know, I'm failing. This institution is deeply flawed. And I can't win here. I'm in a lose lose scenario. And, like, like, I'm looking at dropping out and joining the army. That was a real thing that happened. <laughs> um, you know, it's a real example. I talked through with professors, and they all said, good. They all knew how bad the universe. They said they thought it was a great idea for me to drop out and drop the army. I'm not joking. It's great. Oh, so yesterday you were telling me I'm a genius. Now you're telling me it's good. Drop out and drop the army. These are not mutually exclusive possibilities. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've been through some really weird situations that were with authority figures, right? Like, okay, you perceive me as talented. You perceive me as brilliant. But I perceive myself as vulnerable. I know the help I need. I know the help I'm asking for. And I know how different it is, this thing that you or the institution are, are providing. So look, I, I'd say this to the, the most generous thing I can say about Professor Arguey, maybe now as an old man who's already studied so many languages so many years, maybe he can just sit alone at his desk and study a language for 15 minutes a day. I doubt it. I'm just being honest with you. I don't... So I'm also a mean old man with a lot of experience in languages. How much progress could I make in Chinese for 15 minutes a day? Nothing. No, even Spanish. I'm sorry, even an easy language like Spanish, it's not going to be 15 minutes a day. It's going to be five hours a day. It's, it's you know, you're going to break your brain. I mean, you really have to pour it on to make any progress at all. It's my, my honest opinion here, you know. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's true. However, you know, the most charitable thing I could say is that a small part of his problem, Everything I said earlier in the video, I think, is the larger part of the problem. Maybe a small part of the problem is not having the humility and um, not being able to endure the, the very real suffering of casting your mind back to remember um, what it was like for you when you were in that in that vulnerable position. You know? Oh, great question. Eisel, as a vegan, do you eat canned mandarin oranges in, in syrup? Have we done that even once in the last five years? Is that, no? I think uh, canned fruit um, can be important for avoiding scurvy on long ocean voyages and the exploration of the South Pole. But yeah, that's, that's about it. I, I can't remember the last time. We're not, we're canned fruit? I don't know, man. Could be that could be the title of volume three of my autobiography, canned fruit. <laughs> yep. So you know, a, a note of uh, agreement from someone called Ari. Ari says institutions will never sacrifice their integrity by admitting they are failing. They would sooner let the student body suffer than actually admit they need to change. Um, you know, the, the concept of conservatism is very slippery. China went through a revolution. 
education didn't change. <laughs> education remained conservative. Right? America went through a revolution. Now, I know in New York, at least, they burned the uh, the university down. The main university in New Down was destroyed in, in, the, in the American Revolution. Uh, I think you could go through the different major universities, what was in Boston at that time and Philadelphia. They only had a few uh, in the American, in the 13 colonies, I should say, at that, at that time. America had a revolution. Tell me something, did, did education change? <laughs> now, with, with England, you have to go back probably to the English Civil War. All right. Uh, how about Poland? How about Romania? How about Ukraine? How about Russia? You know, what do we mean by conservative? Like a lot of countries in the past 200 years, or I'm sorry, however many hundred years, in the last 500 years, let's go all the way back, have been through dramatic, profound political changes. But education didn't change. All right. Now, one of my professors at the University of Victoria, just one, he, he's already retired now. He was on the edge of retirement, I know. He had learned Chinese at a time when there were only paper dictionaries and where you had to memorize a lot of arbitrary rules concerning word order to find anything in a dictionary. There were no computer-based dictionaries. There were no mobile phone dictionaries. There's nothing, there's nothing like that. Um, you know, you can completely, you can argue that the transformation offered by information technology, the internet, computers, et cetera, in some ways more profound or more important than the rise and fall of communism, various revolutions that have come and gone. That's debatable. Uh, both are incredibly important, but it's not the same. They're not important in the same way. Okay. We went from an era of paper dictionaries to instant mobile phone lookup dictionaries. And it, it didn't change. The university system didn't change. <laughs> now, sorry, I know I'm generalizing here about a huge part of the world. But, uh, you know, and, and if there are a couple of exceptions, we can make separate YouTube videos talking about them, uh, frankly. But I think that the conservatism of educational institutions, I think it's really important to recognize that that's, it's more extreme, actually, than religious religious institutions. I think it's fair to say that mainstream religious institutions, they profoundly changed with every single one of those examples I just mentioned, but educational institutions didn't. And language education is perhaps the most conservative of all. And, you know, the easiest way uh, to resist change is simply to deny that there's a problem, simply to refuse to measure, measure outcomes. At what point, you know, do people admit there's a problem with the education of doctors and nurses? I'm sorry to say it's only when there are really a lot of dead bodies piling up. It's incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard to get these institutions to admit this problem, even when people's lives are in the line, even when there's a body count. And with something like language education, you're never going to have that kind of palpable outcome to force the institution to re-examine its, its most fundamental assumptions. Okay, so some interesting, um, interesting comments here from Godus Nama. Godus Nama says, Melissa, you might agree or disagree with this, quote, almost all attempts at learning a language are undertaken for vain reasons. People want to be bilingual more than they want to actually speak another language. Quote, my point being that language instruction has fallen to what is demanded by most students. Um, I think that there is a really serious, oh, sorry, you were speaking? Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I think you've made plenty of videos about polyglots. Yes. They seem to be motivated by, in, in, at least in part, in vanity. So you've definitely spoken about this issue, I think, on your channel before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, that's, that's not really the way I, I respond to it. It's true. I've, I've talked about the, uh, the vanity and dishonesty of a lot of people who are making money out of giving advice on, on language learning. Um, you know, what do you do if you're a gym coach, if you're a trainer, personal trainer or something at, at a gym? What do you do if you're training people and you have a client, you have a student who is fundamentally delusional about what they're going to be able to accomplish in the gym, what they're going to be able to learn or something. I think you have a serious moral responsibility as you, as an educator say to them, no, it's, it's not going to happen. It's not how it works. You know, those are not the results you are going to get for whatever reason, you know, um, I think that you have to provide the realism and guidance. You know, I, I think that is an implicit part of my critique of Alexander Orgay, is that I'm saying he has to be in that, uh, in that role, in that position. Now, you know, <laughs> at the start of this video, I talked a little bit about the life of the mind, about being an author. The vast majority of people I've met who wanted to be an author of any kind, whether that's poetry, nonfiction, fiction, the vast majority of people I've met who wanted to be authors wanted to do it for vain reasons. They wanted to do it for the wrong reasons. And they liked the idea of themselves being famous and possibly rich. And many of them, they thought they'd be more sex, sexually appealing to the opposite sex or the same sex, that they did the higher um, sexual status if they were... Uh, there are a lot of people who want to write a book or many books or what have you want to, want to be a creative writer uh, for vain reasons. So what's, you know, what's my obligation? What's my moral obligation in relation to that, you know, or for any of us, you know, I mean, why is it too much to ask, you know, no, do the right things for the right reasons. I mean, that's, that's absolutely what it's all got to be about. And maybe those discussions with people, maybe sometimes they lead to someone recognizing that they shouldn't be writing this book at all. You know, maybe they abandon that project. Maybe they give up on the idea of being a writer at all. They realize that's really the wrong path to them. But more likely, it's going to lead to them having a more profound engagement with and a more profound commitment to whatever it was they wanted to accomplish in the first place to really re-examine what their motivations are and to start making smarter decisions uh, in relation to it. Um, you know, my point being, if you sat down with a stereotypical teenager who says they want to learn Japanese and they want to learn Japanese for the wrong reasons, okay, even if your purpose is to talk them out of it, think it's very likely the outcome of that conversation is that they are going to be more motivated to learn Japanese for the right reasons and to understand what it is they need to be motivated to do, to understand the obstacles they're going to overcome and the, and the commitments they're going to make. So I was just talking to someone, I'm intentionally not going to say what this is, in a university program, and I gave him several options and several pieces of advice. But one of them was, well, what if you drop out of all the courses other than the language course? So that you put 110% of the time in the language course. Because these universities pretend you can do five courses simultaneously, eight courses simultaneously. You can be researching and writing all these essays on different topics while doing this huge amount of memorization, rote practice, and so on. Well, yeah, one way to compensate for that is to, is to just do the language for that year or for those couple of years and to try to really, really get that down. Now... That, that may not sound deep <laughs> in contrast to Vanny. And in some ways it's not, but that's proceeding from this recognition of the seriousness of the task. I mean, as opposed to saying, oh, well, all you need is 15 minutes a day, um, you know, to, to really take it seriously. So look, I mean, you know, uh, maybe I'm being recklessly optimistic here, but that, okay, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. This is my experience in life, and this is a positive experience. When I talk to people who want to do vegan activism for vain reasons, and I criticize the vanity of their reasons, at the end of the conversation, they don't want to give up being vegan. They don't want to give up being political activists. 
they want to do the right thing for the right reasons. Now they want to be, you know, they, they come out of the conversation feeling, you know, kind of refreshed and with a new sense of direction and clarity. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, I realized before I was really thinking about this the wrong way, so on and so forth. I think that if you, that that's my experience, you know? Um, but of course it requires radical honesty. And um, it, it requires a kind of honesty that I think, you know, professors are not trained to have. Professors are trained from an early age to instead be dishonest in, in precisely these ways. If you sit down and explain to someone who wants to learn Japanese just how hard it's going to be and what their reasons should be and what they should expect and how the next 10 years are going to go, or how the next four years are going to go, but how the only, and what, you know, I totally see how for a, a large percentage of people, that's going to result in a deepening appreciation on their part for what language learning is as a process and as a, and as a product. Now we could repeat this even for lifting weights at the gym, but sure, maybe some people are just going to decide that exercising the gym is not what they want to do at all. Mm. Education. So comment from Rasmus. Who have seen in the audience before. Welcome back, Rasmus. Education in general tends to be very biased. Biased. The worst is possibly how psychiatry is considered a science and why use of antidepressants, etc. Yeah. Um, okay. There is no subject on which the students and professors are more equal than the hard sciences. All right, you can, and most professors in the sciences fear this. You can stand up in class and say to the professor, you're wrong, I have a peer reviewed study right here, and here's the footnote, and here's the source, and what you said in today's lecture is false. Physics, chemistry, <laughs> neurochemistry, life sciences, right? Students can catch professors being wrong in the hard sciences so easily. And, you know, sometimes even accidentally, you know, they don't mean to. And I've, certainly professors have a conniption on stage all the time for that reason, because their, their authority can challenge the language. Um, language education is at the opposite extreme. It's the most authoritarian. The student and the professor are at the most unequal. And a student is not even capable of detecting, for example, when the student has asked a good question and the professor is lying to the student because they don't want to deal with it, you know. And, sorry, and it comes up, again, it happens accidentally. Oh, but professor, I thought that word was used this way in this context. So, you know, like, but professor, last week you taught us that word should always go at the start of the sentence, never at the end. You know, it, it can be totally good natured on the part of the student, and it can be mean-spirited on the part of the student, where the student feels they know better than the professor, and the professor should do a better job. Um, you know, uh, so the authority and power the professor holds and the possibility of abuse, um, I think that language education is the most extreme. There's no other field where it's harder for the student to say to the professor, you don't know what you're talking about. You're teaching it wrong, you know? Um, and that is exactly what we need. Um, that's what democracy requires and entails. If you are going to progress from having a fundamentally aristocratic system of education to a fundamentally democratic system of education, we need to have a whole society of people at every level, who are really capable of standing up to those in authority and saying, you're doing it wrong, you're teaching it wrong. Think about the consequences 10 years from now. Think about the consequences of these young people's lives. Think about the measurable outcomes for who's actually learning to speak this language and who isn't, who's learning to be a nurse and who isn't, right? We need to reform our institutions from the bottom up and a lot of the people that are at the top need to be torn down. 